It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon. After that intro, you may think the show is over already, but we're just beginning. So today, uh, the first episode of Tycoons of Small Biz, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. You may think that the program launched today because President Trump's in town and he's the guest for today, but I did have that option and chose to go with Joel and Josh Zolan instead of Windy City Equipment here in Gilbert, Arizona, and they are true tycoons of small biz, which is why I invited them in today and, and wanted to have them have an opportunity to tell their story. So uh, we're going to start with Joel, actually, and Joel... Joel is the father. Josh is the son. Joel is going to tell us what made him get into business himself or what made you open your own business way back when. Way back when. 2003, I worked for a bakery back in Chicago that abused me badly. 100 hours a week on salary, that type of thing. Went back to school uh, for my refrigeration certifications and all that other fun stuff. And the very first thing the instructor said, if anybody wants to have their own business, I suggest either Arizona or Nevada. So I got a $300 bonus for working all that time, and I quit my job, and my wife at the time said, where do you want to go? I said, let's go to Arizona. Came out that weekend, bought a house, and here I am. Been here ever since. Been here ever since. Any any regrets in starting the business then? Oh, no. No, not at all. No, best thing I ever did. My stepdad actually told me I was making a big mistake. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. He, he said I was too young to move to Arizona. And what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't, what are you going to do? And I said, um, the failure is not an option. I mean, it's, you know, he said, do you have to buy a house right away? I said, yeah, it's cheap. So <laughs> bought a house, started a company, had sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in credit card debt from it. But that's what happens. You know, you just keep pushing forward. And 17 years later, it's a multimillion dollar business and have my family working with me. What else could be better than that? Yeah, truly the American dream, right? Yes, yes. And so many small business owners, when they start out, it's it's a similar story, right? It's it's they're just tired of working for somebody else, or they look at it and think, you know, maybe I can do this a little bit better, or it's something else that spurs that, right? And for you, you felt like you were taken advantage of, and absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And and I knew there was something more. I think I invented the concept of wanting more. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and it, it is hilarious to me that. Your father-in-law, you said, who I would no, assume— No, it was my stepfather. Oh, stepfather. Yeah. I'm sorry. So stepfather, who I would assume was also from the Midwest mm-hmm. and thinks that everybody that lives in Arizona is 80 or older, right? Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. And so you or were you too here young to move to Arizona. You yeah, exactly. You come here to party at Arizona State, right. which everybody thinks it's just a party school, and then you, you move back to where you were from. So right. well, that's interesting. So what would you say was the hardest part of the early days in the business? Working. I mean, it was just hard work every day, uh, knocking on doors. You know, we didn't have a single customer. So our son, my younger son, not Josh, but my other son was in school. My wife at the time would hand out flyers and I was knocking on doors. And uh, I'm a talker. So uh, you start meeting people, people, a lot of people from Chicago. Yeah. So we named the business Windy City, and which opened up doors. Didn't know how to charge, didn't know any of that. So uh, you learn as you go. You meet people along the way. And before you know it, you know, you pick up a job for a couple hundred bucks. You pick up, you know. So it was uh, it was tough, but it was worth it. Yeah. So tell, tell us the story about the first job, actually. You've told me a couple of different times versions of that story. And, and you know, somebody I, needed their oven fixed. Yeah, I was working for another company that I couldn't make any money at. They, the way that they paid people was just not normal. It was called ticket time and it was just very difficult to to make money. So I had met a guy and he said, I understand you can fix ovens. I said, I can. And he said, can you fix mine? I made more money on that one job than I had in the last two weeks working for this company. I called my wife. I said, I'm quitting my job. She said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to start a company. So it was literally 
that's how it, it really, I mean, I knew I wanted to start a company, but I didn't know anything about it. So I figured I'd work for somebody for a little while and kind of learn the ropes a little bit. That lasted for about a month and a half. So six was, weeks was all you could take. Yeah. I, like I said, I couldn't make any money. You still have to make a mortgage payment, car payments and, and whatnot. So, yeah. And Josh, so Josh wasn't here at that, no. at that point, your younger son, how old yeah. was he? Back that, then? That's Ryan, right? Yeah, Ryan in 2003. He was born in 98. So, he young, okay. so young he was boy. young, just, yeah. just starting school then. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. So Great. I mean, we had a plan. I was going to, you know, work for this other company and then eventually start a company. My wife was going to work. You know, they had all day uh, kindergarten out here, not at his school. And I didn't feel comfortable with him taking a bus to another school. We didn't know anybody out here. So, uh, you know, while he was in kindergarten, then my wife didn't work after that. So made things a little bit tougher, but you figure it out. Yeah. So Josh, how old were you then? And what were you up to at that point? Oh, at that time, that was, what did we say, 2005? 2003. 2003. Oh, that was 2003. 2003, I was still in high school back in Kenosha, gotcha. Kenosha, Wisconsin. So, you know, he had moved out west, you know, once he got that recommendation from uh, his instructor at the trade school, uh, which was awesome. You know, I, I supported the decision, even though I was still stuck back in the cold weather. You know, and then after that, my path was always, you know, we've had conversations about this. My path was laid out. I knew what I was going to be when I was, you know, ever since I was a kid, I was going to be a stuntman. Yeah. You know, and uh, everybody in my family, including including my dad here, you know, he doesn't often talk about it unless you bring up an actor that he stumbled for. <laughs> but uh, he was also in the business, you know. So I pursued the family footsteps. I moved out to California to be a stuntman in the film industry right after high school. I uh, did that for a while and uh, frankly just got tired of getting beat up. You know, and, and I kind of always had that entrepreneurial spirit in me, uh, you know, and I didn't want to be that crash dummy for, you know, somebody who was deemed more important than I was. So uh, I didn't know what I was going to do after I decided, you know, that that probably wasn't my future. So, and truth be told, I didn't know what he did for a living. You know, I knew he turned wrenches, but that, <laughs> that's that's about it. So, you know, once I really decided that I was done with that, I called him up. And uh, I said, hey, you know, I want to come out and, and work with you. I don't know what you do, but I'll learn it, you know, and I want to come work with you. And uh, and that's exactly what I did. You know, he welcomed me into the business and made it very clear that I had to work from the ground up and learn everything there was to know about being a technician before I could have any involvement in the back end of the business, uh, which I'm incredibly thankful for. I mean, without that foundation, I don't think the company would be where it is today. No doubt. Um, that's kind of around that time how how I got here. So that was 2008? That was, yeah. So 2004, I graduated, graduated high school. 2005, I moved out to California. Then 2000, it was 2008, yeah. I moved out here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now here we are fast forwarding 12 years later, and we can certainly go back to the stuntman thing. I think everybody that, that <laughs> listens would be intrigued by that on, on both sides for both of you, right? Um, and I don't know how much we've talked about this, but I'm I'm an adrenaline junkie. If you talk to my mom or my wife, I'm an absolute adrenaline junkie. I will do anything. Um, and my wife gets a little bit worried when we buy motorcycles or different motorized vehicles because she doesn't think that I um, slow down enough and have control of the vehicle. But, you know, I've been riding all of those kinds of things since I was very, very small and have a very good understanding of what those things can do. And it's it's a great hobby for me to get out there and do those things. And so uh, we'll, we'll certainly talk more about that. But here we are now fast forwarding, you know, 12 years since you joined the business, 17 years since Joel launched the business. And so this is for each of you. What would you say is the hardest part of running Windy City now? And you can choose to talk about COVID-19 specifically, or you can just talk about in general, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, um, but would love to get your perspective on that, and and hopefully our listeners, you know, can commiserate a little bit with you. I would say, you know, I, I cash flow for me. I mean, it's that's what I deal with every day. Uh, it's knock on wood if there's wood around here. Uh, <laughs> we do very well, uh, but it's still always a concern of mine. It's you, you have to stay on top of it all the time. For situations like this with COVID nineteen that hit, you know, we were in a a very strong position yeah. to continue working. So I told Josh when he told me, I think it was probably 2009, if you don't want to work on your hands and knees ever, you know, we're going to have to hire employees. I said, you deal with them because I'll kill them all. <laughs> and uh, 
They're listening, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, and that was pretty much the deal we made. And, and it was, uh, well, I'm just very old school and I want things done a certain way. And, and, and finding people to have the same mindset, you know, Josh being younger and, you know, more hip, I guess you would say. More, <laughs> more, and with the times, he was able to, uh, to handle that. Yeah. All right. So cash flow, which, I mean, you know, you handle the finances for the business. So yeah. that's, that's an obvious choice for you. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's probably deeper than that. And it's, it's the fact that you started it with nothing, right? And yeah. so it's, it was a shoestring budget then. It was just about making enough money to cover your, your mortgage and so forth. And so, so many entrepreneurs continue to be that way the rest of their lives. And it's actually one of those things that makes them the most successful. That makes and, sense. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, where you started, you know, I don't want to go back there. That's for sure. But that's pretty much the toughest thing. It's, you know, I'm at the office every day, you know, all my friends work with us. So it's, <laughs> you know, what am I going to do? I'm not going to yeah. retire and hang up by myself with the dogs, you know, although they'd probably like that. <laughs> so it's, I, I go to work every day. Yeah. You know, but it's really, it's challenging, uh, like I said, I love our employees. They're they're all all great. I hope you're listening. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, it, but they really are. It's we we treat it like a big family. We have their backs. We know everything about them. Their kids, their families. We try and be very much involved with with their lives as well. Yeah, and I can certainly attest to that. I mean, we've known each other probably about a year by now, and I, I've spent a fair amount of time in the office, and you can tell that everybody gets along. You and you enjoy working with these people. Mm -hmm. They respect you. You respect them, and it and it really is a family run business. Even though it's you know you two are the family members, but it truly is a family run business. Yeah. And there's some you know friends from high school from that uh, Josh had that work for you now. And so you know everything that you guys do to make that a family culture, I think is is super important. But you know just just to kind of drill down on that on that cash flow thing. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I work with business owners almost exclusively. And a big issue that I see frequently with business owners is that they do lose track of those finances when things start to go well, right? And so sales are good and they just think, well, everything's going to be great, but they're not watching those books as closely as I know you watch <laughs> those books and, and that gets them in trouble. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, yeah, we hired a person to to kind of take over my job a little bit. And it was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was horrible. It took a lot of phone calls and to make things right and uh, very costly. So it's it's just easier if I do it. It's uh, I'm comfortable with it. And, you know, it's our money. And, and I want to make sure that there's, you know, we like to give bonuses to the guys and, you know, the money has to be there for that. Sure. And the average, I mean, we've learned this through COVID-19, it's, it's all over the news now, but the average small business in this country has less than 30 days worth of cash flow. And so when something like this happens, it affects small businesses in a big oh, way, yeah. right? And, and the whole reason I decided to launch this program and, and launch it now is that, exactly that. You know, I, I don't think that small businesses get enough credit for what we do for this economy, right? Oh. You know, 99% of businesses in America are small businesses. 57%, depending on which statistic you look at, uh, of the population in the United States is employed by a small business, right? So there are large corporations. Everybody knows the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons, all that. But this economy really runs on your backs, right? And my back. I mean, we're all small business owners in, in this room and and what we do matters to the economy, right? Small oh, absolutely. business is big business. And so if without people like you who are willing to get up and to do whatever you need to do to make sure that this business continues to run and people stay employed and continue to take care of their families and pay their mortgages and do those sorts of things, our economy doesn't run. That, very true. Yeah. Very true. So and I, our, our business was definitely affected. Oh, uh, absolutely. You know, by this, you know, um, uh, to the point, like I said earlier, you know, we, we go, I had peaks and valleys, you know, just the not knowing, just the moving of the, of the goalposts every time something, you know, you think it's going well and we're getting ready to open and they move the goalpost on you. They change their narrative and it's, what are you doing? Especially here in Arizona, you know, um, other parts of the country, I know we're hit harder than us. Sure. 
one thing I know about people from Arizona, that they are fighters and they're not just going to lay down and say, okay, it's over. No, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of people fighting t- to stay open. Yeah, no, no doubt. And there's some great small businesses oh, in Arizona. Tremendous. You know, if you look at the Fortune 500, we only have two that have headquarters or have, you know, Who's big offices no, in kidding. Arizona. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, this this whole economy in Arizona is built on, on small businesses. For sure. And, and people are going to figure it out. Innovators are going to innovate and we're going to come out of this stronger than, than ever. That doesn't mean we're not going to see a lull. That doesn't mean that some businesses just aren't going to survive this, right? Unfortunately. And, and so, you know, that's that's the hard part about this. But, you know, I salute you guys for what you're doing to to contribute to the economy, first of all, to contribute to the lives of your employees and, and just the fact that you've been on top of things from the get go. Right. I mean, we've been in contact throughout this a little bit. Josh and I more than 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 you and I. Joel, yeah, you don't but... call me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you don't call. You don't write. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, you know, you, you've been on top of it, understood the importance of it, knew what you needed to do to pivot. You know, I've seen some of the stuff that that Josh has done online and different videos to talk about, you know, how do we survive COVID-19? And, you know, what what are we doing as a company? What are we doing to support our customers? It's those types of things to to where we have to be ready and able to pivot. And I've seen you guys do that. Josh and I have talked about it that you're never prepared for a pandemic. I mean, it's not something, hmm, when's the pandemic going to come by? <laughs> right. um, it, but it's our everyday, how we do things on a daily basis that that allowed us to, to, to I don't want to say thrive, but to continue to do pretty well during during this. Yeah. Uh, and we have a great customer base. I mean, it's it's a partnership. And from day one, when I started the company, it's easy to say I can get rich quick and, and get out of here. But it's you build relationships and you build right. partnerships. And that's what the whole premise of everything that we do. And it's the same thing today and even with our employees. I mean, they stuck with us, you know, even when we had to cut hours because the work wasn't there. But like I said, we have a great crew. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you really do. So, Josh, let's let's turn to you, and, and your your answer, I'm guessing, is probably a little bit different on on what the hardest part of running the business is for you today. Uh, your dad handles the books and, and the payroll and those sorts of things, and so you know maybe not payroll. Don't let's uh, not get uh, carried away here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the cash flow. I should have said cash flow, yeah. not payroll. And so you know maybe that takes that worry off of your plate a little bit. I'm sure you still worry about it and, and think about it, but what specifically is the hardest part of running the business today for you? Talent. And that's nothing against the team that we have. We have the best team in the world. And I think they set the bar for the talent that we expect to come into the company. You know, we, we have such a great team, as, as my dad said, that, you know, whenever we, we look to bring somebody new on, it's, uh, it's very difficult because, you know, our current crew it really expects us to bring somebody on with, you know, that will improve the team. If any of them see that we bring somebody on that doesn't improve the team, they let us know. And when we're talking about the the type of skilled trade that we perform, the pool of talent is very slim. You know, it's it's not easy to find uh, somebody who can have all the skills that we're asking them to have and the character to match. You know, and I know that the same could be said for several different industries. So my perspective, obviously, is only from our own. Uh, but as you know, I mean, I, I I'm deep into the skilled trades and the the skilled trades gap and everything else and. And it does make it very difficult to uh, to find not only adequate talent, but the talent that we're looking for. So to me, that's that's one of the hardest parts, and that and that filters directly into being able to to keep our current team pointed in the right direction. Everybody working toward the same thing. You know, they're all experts at what they do. They're all fantastic at what they do. Sure. Everybody from from you know the install crew to the to the technicians to the office staff. Everybody is fantastic. And, you know, that means that everybody kind of does things their own way, you know, which is fine. And I encourage that uh, because that's how everybody in the company learns and grows. But it's also hard to kind of keep that car in the lane, you know what I mean, when when everybody kind of does things their own way. So, you know, part of my job is to make sure that everybody keeps moving in the same direction and as efficiently as possible. And so that uh, that to me is, has proven pretty difficult as as we grow, yeah. you know, because you're talking about intangible things. You're talking about, you know, being able to 
keep our, our reputation intact. And that's not just the quality in which we perform our work, right? But how we communicate it. And because in this business, it's, you know, everybody is everywhere but the office. You know, we've yep. got field technicians in Houston and Tucson and all around the streets of Phoenix. You know, we've got offices in, in Tucson. We've got an office in Houston. And um, so to keep everybody internally connected is is very difficult. And then you have to add that element of connecting externally as well with our customers. So that's led us to to find innovative ways to keep that communication in order. So that's that's probably the most difficult part of 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 what I do. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that you hit on another big one that's that's true in most businesses, right? When you go through this growth phase cuz early on, Joel was the face of the company. He was the only face of the company. He's the guy who's there meeting with the customer. He trusts what he's portraying to this customer. And now you've got a big crew. Um, tell me tell us how many employees you have today. 40 40. Yeah. So, you know, about 40 employees and I'll bet 25 of them or so are customer facing, maybe all of them in some way, shape or form, but 25 of them may be the technicians that are there, you know, on the ground meeting with the customers and they are the face of Windy City. And you've got to trust that they're portraying what you want to be portrayed as the owners of Windy City, right? And, and I think that that's a really hard thing to do in any business. It doesn't really matter what the business is. As you grow and you turn those reins over to somebody else to be that face of the company, you're putting a lot of trust in them that they're going to that they're going to portray it the way that you want to portray it. Yeah, especially in a service company, right? Because yeah. our product is our people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're not I mean, I know you guys sell things from time to time, but you're typically selling a service, not a product. And so it is, it's not about the product standing up. It's about the service standing up, showing up when you're supposed to, showing up on time, providing a good service, being, you know, providing good customer service and interacting the, the right way. Those, those things are very difficult and certainly are not seen as typical for the skilled trades, right? And so I think it's a, it's a tough thing for you guys to do specifically. And so I'm going to ask you, Josh, to tell us a little bit more about what you're doing to push skilled trades even more uh, in this economy, and you know, I and I'll I'll preface that with something I heard on the radio this morning, where they're talking about you know colleges reopening in the fall, and are they going to reopen? Will they have actual ca- uh, classes, you know, in person? How many freshmen are going to defer for a year? How many of them may not ever go to college at all? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? So you know, I'll, I'll tee that up for you and let you talk a little bit about what you're doing with Blue is the New White and the book and the podcast. You know what I like to talk about, don't you, Austin? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So for those of you that don't know, I authored a book uh, last year called Blue is the New White uh, that focuses on this very topic, uh, the skilled trades. And and actually, you know, in the midst of this COVID crisis that we've had, it actually brought to light how essential, you know, skilled trades workers actually are. Because even though there are a lot of industries that had to lay off uh, plenty of employees and some of them being in the skilled trades as well, they're still deemed an essential business, you know, most of them. I'm a huge advocate, as you know, for uh, the opportunities that are available in the skilled trades that people just don't realize. You know, I had mentioned earlier that I didn't know what my dad did for a living, you know, before I came out here and started working with him. And I think that's kind of reflective of everybody I shouldn't say everybody, but most people in high school, most people in high school don't know what a plumber really does. Most people in high school don't know what an HVAC techni- technician actually is, yeah. you know, and, and that's a problem because, you know, these, these industries are providing such a reward, you know, and, and it takes a little bit of hard work and you obviously have to be smart, but you have to be willing more than anything else. But the biggest thing is that you don't need college to accomplish it. Right, you can you can go straight into an apprenticeship after high school, and we've got a few people in our crew that came to us, you know, right after high school, and they're they're doing fantastic right now, and yeah. and loving life, loving their job, and seeing where this career path can point them. And we're talking about big numbers here, numbers that people just don't realize. I mean, you know, hundred thousand dollars, six figures a year isn't unrealistic, you know, for a seasoned service technician, whether it's in the plumbing industry, whether it's uh, as an HVAC tech or refrigeration tech, even a cooking equipment technician. I mean, these guys 
have a very, very special set of skills and they're very, very intelligent. And there are a lot of people who would forego that in in favor of a college education just because they're told that that's how success is achieved. And so what I try to do is obviously get my book in the hands of educators and people who can influence these kids um, so we can show them what is actually involved in the skilled trades, not just what's perceived to be involved in the the skilled trades. You know, and I also try to speak at different uh, conferences and events around the country uh, to really push this narrative because it has to be, it has to be told, you know, this is wildly rewarding work. And I don't care if you're not in the business, if you've only been in the business a year, or if you've been in the business, you know, 40 years, it is absolutely rewarding work. It can, it can lead to uh, just so much success. Yeah, no, there's there's no doubt, and we've talked a little bit about this before. But I I grew up in a family of of skilled tradesmen, skilled tradesmen, uh, and my brothers today, all of them are skilled tradesmen in one way, shape, or form. And you know, my parents both have GEDs, and have you know they haven't had an incredible life, I would say, you know, financially, but they went to work every day doing something that they enjoyed. Right. And I think that, you know, maybe one of a big regret in my life is that I didn't do what you did, Josh, in going to work with your dad. Right. And and Joel will be the first to admit and has to me in the past that this business wouldn't be what it is today without Josh's involvement. Right. And there are certain things and skills that, that Josh brought to the business that helped you guys take it to that next level. And I think that it could have been that same thing with my dad and I. My dad was a stucco contractor. My uncle was a stucco contractor. My brother is an HVAC contractor and he just took a new job working with the the state government in the state of Utah. But his job is maintenance engineer for different facilities, mainly HVAC type facilities throughout the throughout the state of Utah. And so, you know, I'm I'm very well acquainted with the skilled trades and, and the types of jobs that are available, right? And you're right. I mean, even my parents growing up, you need to go to college. You need to go to college, right? And I don't know, to be honest, because I wasn't there with my other siblings, if they were saying the same thing to them or if they just saw that that was the right path for me. But that was the way that I was raised, even being raised in a skilled trades type family. And I think that we just push this college thing and think, you know, AI and IT and all this is going to is going to work for everybody and there's going to be a job for everybody but we still need people to plumb our houses we still need people to take care of the HVAC systems we still need somebody to pick up our trash I mean all of these skilled trades whatever it is they're so needed in our economy and always will be I don't see any reason that those skilled trades ever go away and a lot of kids just aren't cut out for college. It's not the right path for them. It doesn't mean that they're not smart because they are very smart. They just learn differently potentially, or they have an interest in doing things that aren't college related, right? And so I, I, I think that what you're doing there is, is fantastic. I think it is something that needs to be in the school systems and, and parents and teachers and administrators need to know that there are other alternatives, right? College is not the right decision for every kid out there for sure. Right. And and to get to the to to the heart of what somebody actually makes makes them happy, right? Because look, I'll be the first to tell you, uh, dad, I love you, but I hate fixing fryers. <laughs> I hate it. You know, and 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 because there's nothing fun about, you know, flopping around in a puddle full of grease and doing any of that, but the satisfaction comes from somewhere else, right? The satisfaction comes from the look on the customer's face when you finally get them up and running. It comes from, you know, walking into a place where something is completely lifeless and you breathe life into it, whether it's a fryer or an oven, an HVAC unit, you know, um, whatever it is, you know, those are the passions. And then and then my biggest thing, obviously, is building something bigger than, than myself and that, bigger than all of us in the company, which is the company. You know, and and so many opportunities have come from a career that started fixing fryers or just turning wrenches or laying pipe or whatever it may be. The opportunities are just endless and it, it depends on how you look at it. We're just not taught how to look at it yeah, or to look at it. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, we all thought that by by the year 2000, there would be flying cars everywhere, right? <laughs> we wouldn't need roads. We wouldn't need, you know. And so I, I think that we always kind of push that out there that everything's going to be tech related in the future. But there are certain things that just aren't going to change. And even if they do change, whatever it is that's being built is going to need to be fixed or it's going to need to be built, right? It's not just about writing the code or doing something, you know, from a from a tech standpoint, but it's about actually building and putting everything together. And there's a lot that can be said about somebody putting their head on their pillow at night, knowing that they did, that they accomplished something that's valuable. And it doesn't matter what that is. You know, every person deserves to find something that they're passionate about and brings them a feeling of accomplishment day in and day out. You know, I've, I've had... Hundred, probably hundreds over the over the years of employees that have worked for me in different businesses that I've owned throughout the years, and I've told every one of them if they if they sought any advice from me that they should not be choosing a career based on how much money they think they will make in that career, but choose a career based on something that you enjoy doing and that you know you're going to be able to go home every night and be happy knowing that you spent the day doing something that you enjoyed. And I think that that's just, it's, it's overlooked. I have, I have a lot of friends who are very unhappy attorneys, right? <laughs> and I don't mean to pick attorneys. on attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not that I would ever want to do that, but I don't, I don't mean to pick specifically on attorneys, but um, just, you know, I have several friends who are attorneys that just really don't enjoy their job. They make a great living. They make a lot of money, but they don't necessarily enjoy their job. And, and so I think they, re- they have some regret and they wish they could, could have followed a different path in life. And and that's really what you're trying to do with Blue is the New White, which I think is tremendous. Thank you. So, yeah, so I'll just put the commercial out there. I mean, Blue is the New White podcast and book. You can find it on Amazon. You can tell us wherever else we can find it. Uh, yeah, the book is on Amazon. Audio book actually drops on May 15th. Uh, oh, so awesome. keep an eye out for that. And then the podcast can be found anywhere the podcasts can be found. Spotify, iTunes, all that fun stuff. At Paylocity, we deliver more than our awesome product suite with crazy good reviews. We prioritize your success by covering you with a deep support system to back up our easy to use, innovative HR solutions. Everything we do is designed to support you in reaching your goals. Together, we tackle your day-to-day work so that you can spend more time building the culture you and your employees crave. For professionals who crave true partnership, Paylocity is the HR and payroll company that frees you from the tasks of today, so together we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow. Let's go forward together. All right, so next question, I'm going to start with Joel, and and maybe we'll see if we have a different answer from, from Josh or not, but what would you say makes Windy City so successful? You guys are on the Inc. 5000 list, which is awesome, by the way. But what what has made you so successful to this point? Uh, I would have to say probably the relationships that we've built uh, with our customers, with our employees. How to put it into words? There's I, I luck. There's I'm not going to say that there's not luck involved. Uh, in 2003, at the timing, I believe timing is everything. It was the right time to come out here. There were thousands of companies doing refrigeration but maybe 10 that could fix people fix ovens mm. uh, commercially. So I think timing and then just still believing in a handshake, still believing in uh, one-on-one relationships with customers. Uh, the, the, when I was out in the field, any customer I would go to, I knew their kids, I knew what sports they were involved in, I knew what sports teams they liked. Uh, there was a connection there. And it wasn't just, here's the guy to come fix my oven. Joel's coming. You know, and we'd have conversations and it was building those relationships, I think, was a big part of it. Yeah. Um, we still have quite a few of our customers that we started with, yeah. you know, so for 17 years to keep customers is you're doing something right. Yeah, no no doubt about it. And I, I, I'll probably get this wrong, but I think it was Benjamin Franklin that said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Uh, I don't know if he said that or not, but it's it's true. Yeah. But I mean, there's a lot of truth to that, right? I mean, it, the more effort you put into something, the the luckier you're going to get. Because there is some luck involved. There always is. There's, there's no question. I tell everybody all the time, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I mean, I get to work by, with my kid. 
I work with both my boys, you know, in different aspects, but it's, sure. it's just, it's, it's a blessing every day. You know, it's, I, I wake up, I don't say, oh, I have to go to work today. I get to go to work today. Yeah. And that's a big, it's a big mindset. It's, it's a different mindset. And it, we try and portray that with, with our, you know, uh, with our staff. Uh, I keep telling our staff all the time, I want everybody to be rich. And when they say, well, if I'm rich, I don't have to work with you anymore. I said, yeah, but <laughs> it's not that you have to work. It's, I want you, you to want to, to work here. You yeah. choose to come to work here. And they look at me and they're like, yeah, you know, that makes sense. And uh, because we've got some guys that are, that, you know, do very, very well and they enjoy coming to work every day. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a big deal, right? I mean, you're, you're going to work not because you need the paycheck, but you're going to work because you want to be there. Yeah. Right. And the other thing that, that you kind of hit on is, you know, my personal belief and, and one of the reasons I come up with this title for the podcast is tycoons of small biz. The, the difference between a tycoon and somebody who just is getting into business is the fact that they are unwilling to quit, unwilling to fail. That doesn't mean that there aren't failures along the way because <laughs> every one of us have failures along the way, right? But it, it's being unwilling to quit and to let those failures stop us from continuing. The failures don't define us. Yep. That's for sure. Yeah, no doubt about it. Getting back up does. That's right. It's That's right. That's right. So, Josh, what about you? What do you, what do you think besides the relationships that your dad mentioned and some some luck? What what do you think makes Windy City so successful today? I'm gonna I'm gonna have to give the hats off to the team again. You know, I mean, it's just it's fascinating what what we can all accomplish. Everybody within the Windy City organization, uh, it's fascinating what each and every one of them brings to the table, uh, the drive that each and every one of them shows. You know, and and really, what everybody's willing to contribute to the company—that's that's what I look at, and that's really what makes our company successful. You know, and and I say that above and beyond the the customer relationships, which are also like my dad touched on, which are also yeah. completely vital, and uh, and I can I can contribute a lot of our you know success to to those relationships as well. But you know what? To be perfectly honest, you know. We have relationships. I have relationships that I've nurtured. My dad has relationships that he's nurtured. And a lot of people on our team have relationships that they have nurtured as well. Yeah. You know, and, and each one nurtures their relationships in different ways. And so I I have to attest to the team that that they are why we are so successful. Just unbelievable what they do for the company. Yeah. And and the people that I've met at the company are fantastic, right? I haven't met anybody who doesn't have a great attitude and isn't, you know, you, you walk in the doors at Windy City and welcome to Windy City. You know, everybody yeah. just, you know, says they <laughs> greet you. They're very upbeat. Everybody's nice. You know, I hope Charlie's uh, listening. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's happy, you know, when, when you walk in the door and, and yours, quite honestly, is not a business where there's a a line of customers walking in the door. You're typically going to to their locations, but just the fact that you know they're doing that, I think, is is great. Um, but you know, the the people that you have are great. But that really kind of goes back to hiring the right people and then training them the appropriate way, right? And it and it definitely starts with hiring first, right? You've got to you've got to hire the right person and then train them the appropriate way. But you've got to be able to identify what it is that they have that's going to make them successful at Windy City. So any any tips or tricks for, for those of us listening as to how to hire as well as you guys are obviously hiring? Mm, that's a tough one because I'm usually asking for the advice. You know? <laughs> um, no, you know what? Uh, I'd say, and, and people are going to hate this response, so I'm sorry. I know this is the pilot episode. Uh, so <laughs> I apologize ahead of time. But, you know, there's a gut feeling, I think. Uh, there, there's a strong... and. Sometimes there's that wishy-washy feeling like, oh, you know what? I think they could be good. But sometimes you get that strong gut feeling that just says, you need to hire this person. You really do. And I, again, I'm sorry. I know that's not a, a tactic that anybody can really sink their teeth into. Uh, if they want something like that, they can uh, check out, uh, what's it called? The uh, it's a Personality Index or something like that I just yeah. heard about. I heard good things about that. We haven't actually tried it yet. But uh it's the feeling you get, you know, and I think through the relationships that we've developed over the years, we kind of have developed a sense for it. You know, you shake somebody's hand, you look them in the eye, you have a genuine conversation with them. And a lot of times, you know, you just know if uh, if they're going to be a good fit or if they're not. And sometimes you will have to, 
you know, proceed without knowing because, you know, you won't be able to tell on that first impression. But uh, it, it, it really, it boils down to, to a gut feeling and, and the comfortability between um, both of you in the interview process and everything else. Sure. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, Strengths finders or Myers Briggs, the different personality tests that are out there, and there's there's a bunch of them, um, can can certainly be helpful. But and and I think sometimes we discount when somebody says, "Well, there's a gut feeling," right? But that gut's not something that you had on day one, right? I mean, in 2008, when you started out as a technician at Windy City, you wouldn't have known at that point who would have been a great hire, right? No. And so it's something that you hone over years and it takes trial and error and I'm <laughs> sure that you've had mistakes, right? And <laughs> one and or two. <laughs> there there I'm sure there's still a fair amount of turnover um given, you know, what it is that you do. But it's just about making little steps every day and getting better and, and doing what you can to help to hone your skills so that you're better at hiring going forward. It's about it's about kind of like we were talking earlier. It's, it's about failing, recognizing when you are failing and then using that to improve. And if you can do that a million times, you know, if you can do that a thousand times a year, let's say, the, the small failure, failures and learn from each and every one of them, that's when you develop that that sense, that gut feeling, I think, because you, you just, you've done it wrong enough times to know. Yeah. Well, I think we could all, we, we could all say the same thing as being same thing with that as being parents, right? I mean, we, all of us in this room are parents and I, and we make mistakes every day raising our kids. And, Not me. Oh, <laughs> Josh, can you, can, can you confirm that? Uh, yeah, confirmed. <laughs> uh, I'm, smart, I'm good with smart it. Man. <laughs> smart man. Smart man. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're always making mistakes and we just, you know, we, we do the best that we can every day. There's not a business owner out there that that is perfect, right? There's nobody out there that's that's making the right decisions every day. You know, I think Warren Buffett this week even said that nobody should be worried about him eventually retiring or stepping away because his successor is better than he is, right? And so, you know, we we all none of us are perfect and Warren Buffett makes mistakes on his investments by the way as as well. And so, um we, we you know, we're certainly making mistakes along the way. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. 2003, not to date you, Joel, but you were younger then than you are today. And so I'm going to ask each of you for some advice you'd give today to young entrepreneurs, people who are considering getting into business for themselves and, and what kind of advice would you have? So we'll start with Joel and then let Josh pipe in as well. Follow your gut. I mean, it's it really, if if you have it in you to to want to be an entrepreneur, to to want to work for yourself, do it. Do it. But you have to understand that you are going to be making sacrifices. There are I don't care who you are, or what you have, how much money is behind you. It doesn't matter. You're going to be making sacrifices, whether it's time, whether it's time with your family um, to succeed. You have to be willing to to give it all. Um, I've known quite a few people that, well, I'm going to start my company, but I'm still going to get my, my three weeks off for here and I'm going to go hunting for here. And good luck with that one, because if you're not there to do the job, somebody else will be there to do it. So, um, but follow your gut. Jump in with both feet and just don't have, you know, people say, uh, well, you should have something to fall back on. I never thought of having something to fall back on. It's not what you do. You want to fall forward. You want to keep moving forward. And we say that all the time with Windy City. We keep moving forward. That's that's what we do. I would say I would encourage it. You know, my younger son didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to pay for it either. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I was totally for education. I'm a big advocate of education, but not necessarily college. If he wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or something you need a, a degree for, sure. I'm all for it. But he wanted to be a realtor. So he's now 22 and jumped in with both feet. He's doing extremely well, and, and but he's got us to, to ask questions, yeah. which he does a lot. 
but he's <laughs> no, he's actually doing really well. Uh, but I would say to anybody, you know, jump in with both feet. Uh, don't look back. Don't listen to the naysayers because they are all, you know, I've had conversations with both Josh and Ryan that as you start seeing success, um, you're going to start losing friends. They're not going to understand your drive. They're not going to understand what your what your end game is. And and it's out there. It happened with me. It happened with, I'm sure it's happened to you, Josh. It's happened to Ryan. I know that. And it's it's not that you're better than anybody else. It's not about that. It's you have your motivations. They don't understand it. Well, I'm going to go out drinking this weekend. Well, that's great. I have to work. So you just have to stay true to who you are. And if you want it, it'll be there. Yeah. No, I think I think that's great advice. And, you know, I I understand what Ryan's going through. I was 23 when I first started in the financial planning industry and real estate, just like financial planning, you're trusting somebody with a lot of money, right? You're acquiring a property, for example, uh, in his industry. For me, it was helping them manage that money. Uh, and when you're 23 years old, and for me, I even had a baby face. So I probably looked about 18. I was growing a beard, doing everything I could to try to look older. And so it, it's tough at that age to jump in. But you're absolutely right. You know, I'm I'm a huge proponent of work-life balance. I have kids, you know, I try to do everything that I can to be there for the games and different things like that and t- to not miss things. But that full commitment and work-life balance is probably not possible in the early years of getting something off the ground. And so you certainly do need to go in with your eyes wide open and realize that there's a full commitment. If you want to make this fully successful, you've got to be fully committed. Absolutely. So, yeah, great advice. What about you, Josh? Echoing that just a little bit, I would say, and I see this a lot these days, right? Because there's just so much noise around us. There's so much on social media. There's so much on the internet. There's so much just surrounding us, especially entrepreneur, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur, right? It's on this pedestal today. So everybody wants to be an entrepreneur of, of some kind. So they try a bunch of little different things, right? They try this, they try that, they see what works. Uh, so my advice would be, you know, don't try a million things and see what works. Try one thing and make it work. I think that's what separates me from a lot of other uh, the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial friends that I have and and uh, people that I've known is if you would have told me, you know, when I was 15 years old that I was going to be running a service company when I was 25. To be clear, I'm not 25 now, but um, you know, <laughs> could have fooled me. But, you know, I would have said that they were crazy. But that's the thing is that you don't know what that one thing is, right? You have to, you have to weigh the opportunity, you have to calculate the risk, and you have to make sure that it's a viable option. And then again, back to finding your passions in what you do, right? And so it's it's about that consistency. You have to be consistent. So the second that you run into some adversity or, um, you know, you fail or you fall down, you know, that's not a cue to stop what you're doing and pivot, as the kids like to say, <laughs> you know, into something else. It's it's a cue to learn how not to do it next time and to press on and move forward. So that's, I mean, that's pretty simple advice, but that's my advice, you know, stay consistent, pick one thing and give it everything that you have before you ever change your mind and, and think that it's time to do something else. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's great advice. We all need to identify, you know, something that we're passionate about, right? And it doesn't have to be that you love fixing fryers, right? But you but you are passionate about what your business does for other people. You're passionate about what it does for your employees. You're passionate about what it does for the restaurant owners who rely on you to make their stuff work so that they can provide food to their customers, right? That's what you're passionate about, not specifically about fixing fryers. And, and maybe Joel wasn't even passionate about fixing fryers or well, fixing I was pretty ovens, passionate right? about that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but that's great, right? And so you're passionate about something and wanted to dive in and do something. But it's also about, I would say, maybe this is my advice, is you've got to find a need that needs to be fulfilled. And either it's not being fulfilled at all or it's not being fulfilled well, right? And I think you guys are in a position of it was probably being fulfilled, not as many, right? You said there weren't many people doing it in in that time frame, right? But 
specifically in the skilled trades, you see this often where there's a lot of people out there doing it, but very few people doing it well, mm -hmm. right? And so if you can find a way to do something well in a specific industry and that leads you to an opportunity to build a nice business, more power to you, right? And it, and it can be in the skilled trades, it can be anything, but the reality is there's plenty of opportunity in the skilled trades day in and day out to find your niche and to build that. And I think that's what gets missed, right? Well, uh, you it know, doesn't even have to be the skilled trades. It could be anything you choose. Absolutely. You know, just be the best at it. Yeah. Um, I've had long conversations with my dentist and I wanted to know, when did you know you wanted to be a dentist? He said, when he was like seven, I said, you got your butt kicked a lot. Because, you know, <laughs> and, and he said, you know, but it's, he was passionate about it. And, yeah. you know, today he's got his own practice and, you know, he's a great dentist. So yeah. uh, it's just, it could be anything. It's just give it 110%. Yeah. No, absolutely. Be, be willing to put in whatever effort it needs, whatever effort it takes to be successful in that thing that you choose, right? And that, that gets missed an awful lot by a lot of people, right? And the last thing that I'll say is you mentioned this, you know, how much money is in the skilled trades, right? Or blue collar, right? Your, your book is called Blue is the New White. And so, you know, blue collar is a, a term that everybody's familiar with. Well, I've been doing this for 20 years and, and most of, and you know, financial planning, I, I mean, most of the wealthiest clients that I have that have the strongest businesses are blue collar type businesses, right? And so I don't, I, I think people dismiss that and, and think it's not sexy and I don't want to go into that, right? Before they realize that there's a, there's a way to build an awful lot of wealth and to build a great business in doing essential type activities for for our economy. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate the conversation. I think that we've covered a lot of really important things today and I, I appreciate your guys' input. Is there anything other than what we've covered that you guys would like to cover today or mention today? No, I just I want to give a, a big shout out to all of our customers and our entire team at Windy City Equipment. Thank you so much for everything that you do. And Austin Thank you for everything that you do and for having us on the show and for my family. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. I, I second that. Yeah. No, and, and, and I'll, I'll just add to that. I mean, the, the customers that you guys have, and you obviously don't service every restaurant in the Valley or the country or whatever, but, you know, I wish we personally at Tycoons of Small Biz wish all of the restaurants good luck and let's let's hope that we can all, you know, get through this and and as consumers, I'd love for each of us that are listening to to go out and and buy a meal from a small local business and and remember that franchises are often locally owned by and they are small businesses and so just because it's a McDonald's or a you know a household name doesn't mean that it's not owned by somebody locally that's your neighbor and they're running an important business that's that's important for all of us so please go out and support those small businesses absolutely thank you very much guys appreciate thank you. it thanks Austin we free you from the tasks of today so together we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow Paylocity American provider of cloud-based payroll and human capital management software for small medium, and large size organizations. Paylocity, forward together, always here for you. Paylocity.com. Employers with 50 or fewer people run offices more like family. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast.